I'm Jim Wallace. I'm the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. And I'm to one of the Faith School Fridays. When I was approached, Professor Joe Goldblatt indicated that I might want to talk about creating community through faith, and more specifically, the role of churches in our communities over hundreds of years, and how difficult the last two years have been with all the restrictions on gathering and being church. Now, obviously, I speak from a Christian and more specifically Church of Scotland perspective, but there are, I'm sure, parallels which can be made with the experience of other faith groups. Now, I don't propose to dwell too long on history, but the Church of Scotland has had an historic mission to proclaim the good news to communities the length and breadth of Scotland. The third article declaratory of what might be said to be the Kirk's constitution states, this church is in historical continuity with the Church of Scotland, which was reformed in 1560, whose liberties were ratified in 1592, of whose security provision was made in the Treaty of Union of 1707. The continuity and identity of the Church of Scotland are not prejudiced by the adoption of these articles. As a national church, representative of the Christian faith of the Scottish people, it acknowledges its distinctive call and duty to bring the ordinances of religion to the people in every parish of Scotland through a territorial ministry. Now, it's no secret, even before COVID, that territorial commitment was challenging. And last year's General Assembly passed a Presbytery Mission Plan Act, under which presbyteries must bring forward plans to address these challenges. It's not without significance that the word mission appears in the title, as it is a reminder of the purpose of the structural changes being sought, and can also be said to highlight the Kirk's historic mission to all Scotland's communities. So here we all are in March 2022, two years after the initial lockdown, two years of varying levels of restriction, including variations within Scotland, which faith groups, not least, had to keep on top of. One of the possible silver linings of that experience over the last two years has been the way in which faith communities have come together to share experiences and to make representations to the Scottish Government. One possible fruit has indeed been the establishment of a faith unit within the Scottish Government. And so today, we are a country emerging from one of the most turbulent peacetime episodes in recent history. And I've got to say that even at the time of recording this in early February, I wouldn't be so bold as to predict as to what level of restriction, or possibly even none, there will be in place by the time this is broadcast. COVID-19 has challenged many of the old certainties. The kaleidoscope has been well and truly shaken up. And we have a country in which thousands have known death, serious illness, isolation, employment insecurity, increased poverty, lost educational time, and many of the mental health issues which flow from all that. We have a country in need of healing and coming together to rebuild. But on a number of occasions, I've sensed that whatever the downsides of the impact of the pandemic, and there have been many, there are also signs of hope and signs of renewal. People who previously showed little interest in institutional church or religious life have logged on to online worship. People who before COVID may not even have known who their neighbours were have been undertaking many acts of kindness for their neighbours, some very practical responses to the command to love your neighbor, sometimes without even realizing it. It's a sense that the pandemic has revealed a spiritual longing in our land. And I've been struck that in some of the books which I've read recently, and interestingly, some of them written pre-pandemic, a similar sense of spiritual longing has been identified. If you've not already read it, can I commend Richard Fraser's Travels with a Stick? Not only as an engaging account of his experience when walking the Camino pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. But it relates fascinating insights based on his encounters and observations along the way. Following one such meeting and conversation, Richard says, people carry around in their heads their ideas about the universe, and in their hearts many carry the message of Jesus and are deeply committed to the spiritual search. 
They have an awareness in their hearts of the essence of the spirit of life. Frequently, it's the churchy language that we have used to define these things that puts people off. Another book which caught my attention by an American Episcopalian pastor and writer, Alan J. Roxburgh, it has the exceptionally long, challenging, and you might say somewhat ambitious title of Joining God, Remaking Church, and Changing the World. Roxburgh claims, we don't live in a world of unbelief. People are yearning to believe in something, but churches can't capture their attention. And although writing from a North American perspective, Roxburgh takes as his starting point what he's described as the unraveling of the Euro-tribal churches, a familiar story of declining numbers of aging congregations and strategy plans which never quite succeed in reversing that trend. But he's far from downbeat. He believes that the spirit is disrupting and calling our churches into a new imagination about what it means to follow the way of Jesus. And I find that sentence very affirming. And it has come to mind on a number of occasions when I've seen the outgoing witness of congregations. Last October, I made a series of visits during my visit to the Edinburgh Presbytery, and I saw many examples of congregations engaging in new imaginings. I visited the Greyfriar Charters Centre, an imaginative use of an old church building, but through innovative partnerships and imaginative use of space, we have an example of the church reaching out into a very diverse and lively community in new forms of mission and embracing people of other faiths and of none. The Granton Grows Greener project is just one of the projects at Granton Parish Church, where good clothes are recycled in a way which both addresses an environmental imperative with a means of assisting people on limited means with a clothes bank. At Richmond Craig Miller, Richmond's Hope has since 2003 been providing support for children and young people who have been bereaved. It provides a safe space for the child or young person to work through their grief and explore their feelings. And I could cite many other examples. These are just three very different ways in which congregations have been engaging in imaginative ways with the community, and not on any exclusively Christian basis. Obviously, they have had to make arrangements to comply with COVID arrangements, but they provide an antidote to the headlines which are invariably negative and doom leading And as both interfaith and interdenominational, we aspire to greater manifestation of unity. I believe that community must play an important part. Living in a Western country in the 21st century, people of all faiths can recognize in our society the cult of the individualist, consumerist approach to living that places the verb to have ahead of the verb to be. But I very much believe that whilst in our respective faiths, we seek an individual relationship with the divine, there is fulfillment in being part of a community of faith. I will remember my excitement on reading Archbishop Desmond Tutu's book, God is Not a Christian, and being introduced to that wonderful African concept of Ubuntu. He says it is difficult to translate into English, but suggests a person is a person through other persons. And he turns around Descartes' maxim, I think, therefore I am, and says, I am because I belong, or I am because we are. And surely it's through building positive and loving relationships with others, including within our own faith community, that we may find our own individuality enhanced. And in turn, the life of our respective denominations or faith communities can be enriched by building relationships with others. Looking back over my time as moderator, one of the memorable events was the multi-faith prayer vigil in George Square, Glasgow, at the start of COP26. It was a remarkable and a poignant coming together as we prayed together, making common cause for our threatened common home. Not only were the personal relationships established, but there was little doubt that our voices were stronger and amplified because we acted in community. No one's asking us to give up deeply held tenets and beliefs of our faith, but maybe the last word should belong to Archbishop Tutu. He said, because the divine, however named, however apprehended or conceived, is infinite, and we are forever finite, we shall never comprehend the divine completely. So we should seek to share all insights we can and be ready to learn, for instance, from the techniques of the spiritual life 
that are available in religions other than our own. We have enough that conspires to separate us. Let us celebrate that which unites us, that which we share in common. Hello, mindfulness is a practice that owes its roots in yoga and particularly in Buddhism where it forms an essential part of the Buddhist practice. More recently, it has been adapted in the West so that people of all faiths and none may reap its benefits. It is that secular practice from which I have actually gained so much. Ironically, I tried other forms of meditation and I was unsuccessful. However, mindfulness with its focus upon breathing and being in the moment turned out to be easily accessible to me and I hope it is for you as well. Now, may I please invite you to join me in a moment of mindfulness. Find a ch comfortable chair to sit in. Allow your feet to be flat on the ground in front of you. Feel your back supported by the chair. And then allow your eyes to get soft and blurry. And if you're comfortable, you can even close your eyes as we begin to focus on our breathing. As you inhale, inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. As you inhale, feel your tummy swell and expand. And as you exhale, feel it gently contract. This means that you're taking in full breaths, deep breaths. Inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. And now inhale once more, and this time as you exhale, feel the breath go all the way to your toes. Gently wiggle your toes so that you feel just your toes, only the toe of the foot. Continue to inhale and exhale and feel the front part of the foot, the ball of the foot. And now feel the instep of the foot as you exhale. Feel the air rush into the sole of the foot. And now as you exhale, feel the energy in the heel of the foot. And now as you inhale and exhale, feel both feet simultaneously, just the feet. Continue to inhale and exhale, and now let the energy move to the ankles. Gently move the ankle left and then right to isolate your feeling just in the ankles. Inhale and exhale, and this time feel the energy flow down to the calf of both legs. And now as you inhale and exhale, feel the energy in the knees, in the back of the knees. Feel all the little tendons and corpuscles in the knees. And now feel the energy flow into the long muscle of the thigh, both thighs, first left and then right. And then both as you inhale and exhale, feel the energy move fully into that long muscle of the thigh. And now feel the energy move into the bum and feel the bum relax on the chair and the lower back relax. And now as you inhale and exhale, slowly feel the energy move up the spine. And as it moves up the spine, feel each vertebra gently lift and separate with your breath.
As you inhale and exhale this time, feel your shoulder blades start to expand. Imagine that they are the wings of a butterfly. And as you exhale, the shoulder blades will open gently and allow them to relax. And now feel the shoulders start to relax and to gently glide down the torso. Now feel the biceps and the upper arm relax and the triceps behind the biceps relax as well. And now the elbows, the lower arm, the wrist, and gently move your wrist, first the left wrist, then the right wrist, and isolate just the movement in the wrist. And now feel the palm of the hand. And as you exhale, feel it get warmer and warmer. And then let the fingers relax, stretch gently, wiggle your fingers, and isolate just the movement in the fingers. And now as you continue to exhale, feel the energy glide up your neck and into the base of the head and feel the head gently lift off of your shoulders as though you have a string attached to the top of your head and it's lifting the head ever so slightly. And now feel the energy in the forehead, the cheeks, the nose, the chin. And as you continue to inhale and exhale, gently let your eyes open or come back into focus so that you're able to complete your moment of mindfulness in a more relaxed, centered, and mindful state. I hope you've enjoyed this moment of mindfulness. <laughs>